Bolak nanti ya. Marina sendiri ya. Ya oke, okay, makasih. Ini peserta kan udah pada masuk nih, iya gini. Uh, uh, ini ada berapa peserta ya, mas yang daftar? Banyak sih, tapi ini baru sembilan yang yang sudah online baru sembilan. Oh, lama kalau mau dimasukkan, ini sudah mulai record ya? Ini sudah record. Kita online kan di. Ini start kayak kemarin ya, setengah 8 ya? Oh,
ya mbak Silahkan sama-sama Halo Deh Yuli. Ya Bu, juga ngejang selamat uh, pagi. Ada di tim di situ yang uh, apa namanya? Semua yang soundnya hidup. Coba yang coba dilihat Deh Yuli sama Mbak Nadia ada ada WA yang belum silent enggak karena bunyinya notifikasi WA sangat mengganggu sekali kemarin di YouTube. Banyak bunyi oh, bunyi notifikasi WA. Berarti ada mungkin pakai laptop sehingga Bisa laptopnya ya, dibuka ini. dengan WA laptopnya WA, itu kadang-kadang kanting uh, kanting di disconnect atau di silent setting kemudian notifikasinya diklik no notification. Oh, iya. Saya sudah mati nggak pakai WA, nggak pakai WA ya. dulu nih. Coba Mbak Novia kemarin soalnya terasa banget. Iya, punya saya sudah di off kan ini Bu. Uh, mungkin uh, dari coba yang Mbak Alvina mungkin... di, di silent Mbak Alvina, Mbak Mbak Nisa, Mbak Nisa, Mbak Nisa halo. Sudah, Kemudian Bu, ini sudah. siapa yang Mbak, Mbak Nisa sama Lisa? Adiva, Mbak Nisa, halo. Mbak Nisa, Mbak Nisa zoomnya malah belum bisa masuk. Ini ada nih, dia, dia sudah ada nih. Tapi uh, tapi zoomnya masih belum bisa masuk. Coba biar masuk, masuk kan. Biar masuk ruang soalnya bu masuk kok nah, di ruang sebelah. Ya. Siapa Adiva sakit ini siapa? Ini. Yang tahu Mas Eko, Bu, ada Mas Eko di situ. Mas Eko. Mas Eko. Mas Eko. Mas Eko. Uh, ini yang kata Adi Basa Kinul Arif. Saya itu mendeteksi banyak suara. Suara WA web masuk. Coba kalau Mbak Nisa mana? Mbak Nisa belum Mbak masuk itu, Bu. Di partisipan belum ada. Kalau di... di silent semua kemudian hanya Mbak Novi Mas Eko masih ada suara WA web enggak? Tang ting ting tang ting kemarin di YouTube. Soalnya yang bisa silent cuma host. Masih Ibu. Di silent semua kecuali nanti bisa nggak? Ini sudah mode silent semua uh, dan tidak bisa mengunmute diri.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Novia Handayani, and I will be your host today. It is such an honor to welcome you here in this event. So let me begin by giving you a warm welcome to the visiting program themed heat stress lecture and research topics. In this lovely moment, I would like to say welcome to our today's lecturer, Professor Thomas E. Bernard, PhD. He is a professor from College of Public Health, University of South Florida. Good evening, Dr. Bernard. Our today's moderator, Hanifa Maherdeni, PhD, from Faculty of Public Health, Diponegoro University. Selamat pagi, Bu Hanifa. Selamat pagi. Honor... Good morning. Good morning. The Honorable Dean of Faculty of Public Health, Diponegoro University, Dr. Budiono SKM MKS. Selamat pagi. Also to all of our respected guests and participants. First of all, let us say thank you to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala who has been giving us mercy, guidance, happiness, and healthy, so we can attend and participate in this event without any obstacles until now. Praise and salutation upon our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the last messenger, the best figure of this universe. In this special morning, we have several agendas. So please allow me to read several sequences of our agendas. The first is speech from the head of Master of Health Promotion, Dr. Yuliani Setianingsi, SKM MKS. The second is speech from the Dean of Faculty of Public Health, Dr. Budiono, SKM MKS. The third is lectures and discussion with Professor Thomas E. Bernard, PhD. Today's event is followed by participants from all around Indonesia, mostly from Faculty of Public Health with total 100 participants. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all begin this event by reciting Basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, I just get an information that the Dean and the Vice Dean cannot join us right now. However, the Dean will join us later uh, at this morning. Our dearest participants, let us get into the first session. So please welcome to the Honorable Head of Master of Health Promotion, and please also be willing to open this event. Dr. Yuliani Setianingsi, SKM MKS, the screen is yours. Okay, terima kasih, Mbak Novia, MC kita yang cantik pada pagi hari ini. Uh, selamat pagi, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, peserta kuliah tamu atau visiting profesor di program Magister Promosi Kesehatan. Uh, good evening, Dr. Benhal. Thank you for being willing to join with us for sharing knowledge about heat stress. Jadi uh, 
Bapak dan Ibu pada kesempatan ini kita bertemu kembali dalam acara visiting profesor. Pada pertemuan ini adalah pertemuan uh, yang kedua setelah kemarin kita bicara tentang ergonomi. Pada pagi hari ini kita akan diskusi dan mendengarkan paparan Profesor Benhart tentang uh, heat stress. Saya mohon uh, kita bersama bisa mendengarkan dengan baik karena ilmu ini tentu saja meskipun saya yakin uh, Anda semua sudah pernah mendengar tapi akan menjadi hal yang mungkin yang hal yang baru ada beberapa hal yang baru yang bisa kita diskusikan bersama. Jadi harapan saya topik ini tetap selalu menarik uh, untuk kita diskusikan dan kita dengarkan. Selamat mendengarkan paparan tentang heat stress pada pagi hari ini dan mohon maaf bila ada beberapa kekurangan dari kami panitia. Terima kasih waktu saya kembalikan kepada MC, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And to open this event as well, Dr. Yuliani. Before we move to the next session, I would like to remind our respected guests and participants to fill in the register form. We will share the link on the chat room. Kepada Uh, peserta yang kami hormati, kami mohon untuk dapat mengisi link registrasi yang nanti akan kami share pada chat room. To any of you who have questions for our speaker, please kindly write down your questions on the chat room, or please kindly raise your hand and wait to be called by our moderator to ask directly. Kepada Anda yang memiliki pertanyaan untuk pembicara kami, mohon untuk dapat menuliskan pertanyaan Anda pada kolom komentar atau kolom chat di Zoom ini, atau Anda juga dapat uh, mengaktifkan fitur raise hand sehingga Anda bisa uh, bertanya langsung kepada pembicara setelah dipersilahkan oleh moderator. Last but not least, please kindly turn off your microphone during this event, except you are allowed to turn it on by our moderator or our speaker. Dimohon kepada para peserta untuk dapat mengnonaktifkan uh, mikrofonnya sehingga dalam kondisi mute, uh, kecuali Anda dipersilahkan untuk menyalakannya oleh moderator atau oleh speaker atau pembicara kami pada hari ini. <laughs> Now we are going to move to the most important session for today's event, the lectures and discussion from Professor Thomas E. Bernard, PhD, or Dr. Bernard, moderated by Hanifa Maherdeni, PhD. It is now my pleasure to introduce our today's moderator. Hanifa Maherdeni is an associate professor in Diponegoro University, Faculty of Public Health. Dr. Deni studies in Indonesia, the Philippines, Sweden, Germany, and USA were focused in public health, majoring in environmental and occupational health. She was the former president of the Indonesian Public Health Union, or PERSACNI, in 2008 to 2017. She was also the former Dean of Faculty of Public Health Diponegoro University in 2015 to 2019. And an independent consultant in occupational health and safety for WHO, ILO, Ministry of Health of Indonesia, and GTZ, as well as the member of the National Council of Occupational Safety and Health Republic of Indonesia. Now to the beautiful and the cheerful Dr. Denny, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Mbak Novia. Uh, today I'm the moderator, will uh, be with you and um, facilitating you to uh, answer the question whether you can um, answer in English or in Indonesia. However, I would like to introduce our um, senior occupational health expert, Dr. Bernard. So I would like to introduce him. Uh, his name is Professor Thomas A. Bernard, and he is here for uh, the program of uh, World Class University Visiting Professor, Virtual Visiting Professor, and he was formal. Um, he was my uh, ad, uh, PhD advisor, and he has seventy uh, seven hundred eighty-four uh, documents, and with Scopus H Index seventeen, and this is very high if we consider the um, average of of uh, Scopus H Index of Indonesian uh, professor. 
And then uh, Dr. Bornot is a professor at the University of South Florida College of Public Health and he has been practicing for 45 years with teaching, research and public uh, engagement in occupational health. And he has a special interest in heat stress and ergonomic. And Dr. Bernard is also the director of the Sunshine Education and Research Center, which is a training and um, but a training grant. Um, yeah, a training grant, and then he participates in professional committees to pro to promote workers' health. Uh, jadi Dr. Bernard itu profesor dari uh, College of Public Health University of South Florida yang sudah berpengalaman selama 45 tahun dengan Scopus H in H index sebanyak 17 dan beliau juga direktur Sunshine Education and Research Center yang mengelola dana-dana untuk training di bidang kesehatan kerja. Um, Dr. Bernard the time is yours. Thank you very much again for the warm welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to meet with you uh, again this morning. I, and um, I hope that uh, I'm able to convey to you the, uh, the, the enthusiasm I have for the topic of uh, heat stress. And um, w with that, let me uh, see if we can move to my slides. So this evening's topic is going to be occupational heat stress. Uh, when we say occupational heat stress, I then generally mean that it um, that we focus on people of working age. So it, it will be adults uh, and in reasonably good health. So we'll exclude the elderly and, and children from uh, this discussion. Uh, again, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, the invitation from uh, from your university. It's a, a, a an honor uh, to to be chosen to to present the seminar. Uh, I do want to recognize the University of South Florida, who's been my uh, employer for over thirty years now. And I've had many sponsors of my work with regard to heat stress, so I, I, I can't name them all, but it's been an incredible uh, support. Uh, CDC NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, has been um, also funded my research and funds the, uh, the training of our students in the Sunshine Education and Research Center. I do participate on the ACGIH uh, and ISO committees uh, for physical agents for the ACGIH and thermal environments for the ISO and all of the members of the committee that helped me to uh, better understand and express um, um, my thoughts about uh, heat stress. And then again, I want to remind you that the opinions are mine and, uh, and do not reflect any of the sponsors of my work. So the first statement I hope is, is clear. Uh, it's heat related illnesses are real. That this is, is not um, a, a rare event. Uh, it's not isolated to the US. Um, it, it's certainly worldwide. Um, and uh, just looking at the case um, that NIOSH has made for heat stress in the United States in their criteria for a recommended standard were that, that uh, there were approximately 28 uh, deaths per year over a, over a 15 year period. Um, 
there's uh, that rate is 20 times higher for crop workers than for all other workers. And, um, and really a problem among outdoor workers in general. Um, heat stress has been better at rec. I, the reason why I think we see it in outside workers now more is that, is that we've recognized heat stress among indoor workers in classic uh, factories and manufacturing areas. And, um, and they have uh, done a good job of um, managing the exposures. We have a, a little bit less uh, of a focused effort in the construction industry for a number of reasons, and then in agriculture. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States also points out that there were substantial lost time um, cases due to heat stress. Um, and uh, as I pointed out a moment ago, fat fatalities are mostly among outdoor workers. And, and this is the case in um, other developed countries. And, um, and of course, in developing countries, um, it, the outdoor workers are, are uh, uh, again, remain a problem. Uh, it's kind of interesting in that many uh, heat stress cases probably are not reported or misdiagnosed as heart attacks or other um, illnesses when, when they are reported to a, an emergency department. Um, our enforcement agency, OSHA, has been active for a few years uh, in um, with an emphasis on heat stress, uh, when they uh, have made citations, um, most were cited for deficient programs. And they also noted that uh, when there's been a fatality, there was uh, no provision for acclimatization. We're going to come back both uh, in detail about program and program approaches to heat stress. And I will discuss uh, uh, a little bit about acclimatization. Uh, for exertional heat illness, I, the, the literature is, is, is uh, in recent years is really pointed to the problem that, it, that uh, heat illness associated with work or, or sports um, has been as is is clearly linked to the uh, environment and especially the heat and humidity. Uh, I saw this uh, in a couple of studies with aluminum smelters. Uh, a number of people have reported this in high school and college sports as well as some professional sports. I've just talked to you of, um, about outdoor work. And uh, for military training, uh, there's been some very extensive studies uh, that, that clearly relate the um, heat illnesses and military recruits to the level of heat stress. Um, and, and so the, really the bottom line and the point is, is, is that these aren't anecdotal cases. They're not um, scattered around. There's a very clear uh, exposure response relationship. And so in occupational health, when we see the fact that the probability increases with the level of, of the exposure, that that's really a very strong case that, that this is in fact an occupationally related uh, hazard. I, so I think that case has been clearly made. What we're also seeing and uh, have yet to really focus on how we can deal with it is that there's a carryover risk. In other words, if the uh, level of heat stress on the preceding day was also high, that there's an enhanced risk on the uh, current day. And we just um, uh, are wrapping up a study looking at heat related disorders and aluminum smelters in the Middle East. And we once again, see both the exposure response relationship and the, uh, the carryover effect from the previous day. Uh, other observations that sometimes aren't as uh, well appreciated is that uh, first there's an, 
there's an increased uh, rate of unsafe acts. So as we uh, get hotter and hotter, that the if a baseline is in a comfortable environment, is whether it, the work is light or moderate, is that there will be an increase in unsafe behaviors as the heat stress level goes up. And at moderate work, it, which the occupational limit is about here, we're already now seeing a 50% increase in unsafe behaviors. When we go and look for acute injuries, uh, we, we do see, uh, again, a pattern that suggests that if you use a baseline of below the occupational exposure limit is the reference level, that the odds ratio, in fact, do increase with modest increases above the occupational exposure limit and then a more significant increase. So, so not only are heat-related disorders uh, re, uh, related to heat, but also there's an increased risk of acute injury. And again, we've seen this now in uh, a number of industries and, and, and across a number of investigators. The other uh, uh, factor that's uh, associated with heat is decreased productivity. And I, and I kind of mentioned yesterday uh, quickly, but the, uh, this is the uh, a productivity measure is bundles of rice per hour in a study done in the uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And you can see that as the uh, environmental temperature goes up, the productivity goes down. And this productivity loss is, is associated with people who are also uh, having incentive pay. So they, they really do... Uh, uh, are pushing themselves. And the other thing to note is that later in the day, so one is in the first hour and then the, the second line is in the fifth hour of the day where heat has uh, had a, a larger role. So it, it, it causes heat related illnesses, it causes um, unsafe acts, uh, acute injury and, and losses of productivity. So this really makes the case that heat stress management is important. And what I wanna do here is, uh, is share with you what I think are some of the very critical features that uh, we ought to have in, in managing heat stress, um, just to, it, it, regardless of the, um, the environment, regardless of the situation that these exposures are occurring. Um, so the key elements are heat stress assessment, um, heat stress hygiene practices, surveillance, emergency response and first aid plans, policies dealing with uh, discretion and acclimatization, and then finally the key element of, of training. Um, I'm going to uh, step through each of those briefly. Uh, so heat stress assessment, I, I will go later uh, in the morning into uh, a more detailed method of assessment uh, that is the, the rigorous approach that an industrial hygienist would take to, uh, to evaluate heat stress. But there's really two things that I've learned uh, over time is, first of all, many people I've consulted for are willing to just simply make a qualitative judgment that heat stress is present. In other words, they, they don't need somebody to measure the temperature and humidity and the work demands and, and say, boy, this level is just too high. Uh, and then the other is that I wanna suggest to you a kind of semi-quantitative analysis and I'll use the heat index is uh, that measure. So a, a very kind of simple approach that it just has a little bit more stratification than simply saying that the heat is present. So the heat index uh, is um, a, a report of uh, the combination of the air temperature and the relative humidity. It's popular in the United States. Uh, there are variations of it that are known around the world with slightly different names. 
Um, what I'll just ask you to, to um, believe is that we can, in a very straightforward way, express um, uh, 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 the important characteristics of the environment, which are the uh, temperature and humidity uh, in, in, a, in a simple index. Uh, in this case, and this is where I've been giving this some thought, is that there is a range where we consider the risk to be acceptable. There's, there's just a, a, a very unlikely that, a, that any heat-related illness is going to emerge. There's a zone where there's a heightened risk for workers who are unacclimatized. Uh, and then as we progress a little bit higher, there's a heightened risk for all workers, and that includes those who are acclimatized. Uh, when you reach the high level, uh, there's a risk for all workers um, that, and, and that risk gets to be about 10% of the exposures. Uh, where there's be a very rapid rise in body core temperature. And that's a, a critical uh, appreciation. And then once we uh, get to the extremely high, then, uh, then that probability uh, becomes uh, quite substantial of, of having an uncontrolled heat stress exposure. Uh, and in the United States, we have um, uh, um, these uh, charts that relate the air temperature uh, and the relative humidity to a heat index value. And, and as, you, as you would guess, is either the humidity increases or the temperature increases, the heat index will increase. And then uh, mapping out these kinds of zones of acceptable to extremely high is a graphic way that's often used um, to, to convey a, a, a sense of risk uh, to people who uh, don't have um, a, a very sophisticated understanding of heat stress. In, in other words, we're back to that well-trained industrial hygienist. Okay. Um, the next is heat stress hygiene practices. Uh, okay, so I list five of them here. What's characteristic of a hygiene practice in my mind is that these are things that an individual worker can do to protect themselves. So it's, it's, uh, it helps increase or manage the, the, uh, the ability of an individual to tolerate a heat stress exposure. It doesn't convey any uh, benefit to coworkers or others. So heat stress hygiene practices become a health maintenance issue and it's the responsibility of the individuals to, to actually uh, perform them. And I, and I do want to just uh, spend a slide on each of these uh, hygiene practices. So self-determination is first. This is going to come back as a policy statement as well. But self-determination means that once you're very uncomfortable, so excessive discomfort, or you experience any of the early symptoms of a heat-related disorder, you ought to seek some recovery. Uh, that that exposure is very likely to uh, uh, already, already be associated with uh, uh, a significant physiological uh, strain. And if this were to occur in the laboratory, we would have stopped the exposure. Uh, it requires an element of trust on the part of supervision. I put this statement in there as a, as a general kind of, uh, of uh, a point in that uh, supervisors do help set the tone for health and safety. Hey, my experience in large companies that are experienced with, with good programs of heat stress management is that the supervisors um, pretty, pretty well understand the, uh, the risks and the importance of, of, of some self-determination. 
I also find that even in the more in, in, um, informal outdoor sectors of work, that the, um, that the supervision is um, going to be sympathetic to somebody who uh, reports that they need to take a break. The, the real problem is self, uh, is, um, or, or the real objective, I'm sorry, is the self-pacing of work. People are very good if, uh, if they're allowed to pace the work to be able to deal with the stress of the exposure. What makes things more complicated is not so much a supervisor, but, pardon me, but it's the, um, it's incentive payments. So where, we're, where somebody is going to have a financial incentive to override their good judgment, that's a point where we might have problems. Uh, fluid replacement is another key issue. And, and when we get to acclimatization uh, and, a, and, and, and in a couple of other locations this morning, uh, we'll talk about the fact that uh, sweating is, is crucially important to maintaining um, uh, body temperatures in an, accept, in an acceptable range. So water, and we have to replace that water. Um, uh, the key element that I want to point out here is if we wait until we're thirsty to start to drink, that we're already uh, dehydrated in an important way. So in the US, what we try to do is make drinking a habit so that people will have small amounts of water or whatever drink they have uh, frequently rather than trying to consume large quantities of water during um, hourly breaks or waiting until they're thirsty and then trying to, uh, to replace the lost water. Um, there are several things we know about fluid replacement for occupation exposures to heat. And I'll distinguish those from sports and, and other very high performance demands. But water is the essential component. It's water that we need to replace. Uh, what we have found repeatedly in both field and laboratory studies is that, that people will drink, first of all, more water if it's cool and reasonably close. They will also drink more fluids. They'll drink more water if it happens to be flavored and they'll drink even more water if it happens to be in one of these commercial um, sports drinks. So it's not that the sports drink provides electrolytes and sugars and things like that that's important, but what, it, but what they do do is they're, they're finely tuned to appeal to people who are uh, sweating so that they will, um, in, in terms of the taste, uh, we'll drink more water. Um, for years, we thought caffeine was uh, a sufficiently strong diuretic that you shouldn't drink it uh, during heat stress exposures. Uh, that uh, has been demonstrated to be uh, a, a, a false precaution. Uh, caffeine uh, in coffees and teas are, are certainly acceptable um, it, periodically during the day. Uh, it's not that we would say you ought to have exclusively caffeine drinks, um, but, um, but uh, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't receive that kind of prohibition that we had uh, assigned to it previously. Um, for again, hygiene practices, lifestyle and diet. Lifestyle really means getting an adequate amount of sleep. Uh, it should have limited exposures to heat stress outside of work. 
Uh, remember, we've got already a carryover effect from the previous day. And if we don't get recovery, full recovery during the uh, periods outside of work, this can be a, a problem. And uh, uh, the other is um, any ab abuse of uh, drugs or alcohol are, are likely to um, increase the risk for heat intolerance. A uh, diet, uh, a well-balanced diet, and perhaps a little extra salt, but not necessary, uh, is important. Um, I, I of, of course, I'm not familiar with the practices in Indonesia, but you know we have um, uh, weight loss programs that are of, of various sorts that that uh, are very popular in the United States, and and almost all of these weight loss programs um, will. Um, provide a false sense of the amount of weight loss that's really a water loss, so a, a progressive dehydration rather than a genuine loss of uh, fat. So, so we, we do worry about people claiming weight losses that uh, are, are likely to be associated with water and not the diet. Um, and health status is a... Is a, is a another hygiene practice, uh, you'll, um, um, uh, I'll come back, to, or I'm, go I'm going to emphasize this at the moment, but anybody with a chronic disease, um, it's likely that the disease itself or the medications that would be taken to help manage that disease will lower the tolerance for heat stress. So we really encourage that uh, anybody with chronic disease consult with their healthcare provider and clearly inform them that, that they're exposed to heat. Um, in the handouts I um, provided is that there's a, a medical review handout. That's something that um, that I've been passing out to my consulting clients for a number of years and, 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 and generally passing it out to others in, in seminars and training sessions. I think this helps summarize a number of the issues that are related to, uh, to uh, disease as well as uh, drugs. And, and the drugs are prescription drugs, um, what we call recreational drugs, as well as um, over-the-counter uh, commonly available medications. With acute illness, uh, we really offer some um, advisory, especially if, if someone has a fever or uh, the potential for dehydration because of uh, vomiting or diarrhea, and sometimes the use of prescription or commonly available over-the-counter medications will affect heat tolerance. Uh, ideally, we would like somebody to stay home if they're ill. That's a good public health practice. Uh, and, um, and it's not followed very well in the United States. Uh, the, 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 the choice then is to at least report it to the supervisor and the supervisor should, and the individual should appreciate that their tolerance for heat stress is probably going to be lower that day than on another day. Uh, for surveillance, I am uh, only going to mention a couple of things, uh, but environmental surveillance is, uh, is helpful. Uh, it, provides uh, some guidance, at least for trigger points for different actions. Uh, we'll talk later about things like work rest cycles. When would you start to trigger those actions would, would be involved with environmental surveillance. Uh, for medical surveillance, I've already referred to the, uh, the handout for chronic disease and, and the uh, goal of uh, seeking the advice of a healthcare provider. And then for acute injury illness, uh, reporting it to a supervisor. So the surveillance is both an environmental surveillance and a medical surveillance. 
again, in larger companies, this has been no problem at all. So you have an oil and gas industry and, and chances are very good that, that, that they are addressing um, these actions. Okay, um, now an emergency response plan and first aid plans. I have uh, really come to believe that this is incredibly important. We're setting up a system where we believe that we're protecting uh, most workers, uh, but we're not getting everybody. Uh, we, we've got uh, the fact that the, the, there's as much intra-individual variation as inter-individual variation. And so we have difficulty knowing who on a given day might be uh, at particular risk for an overexposure. So the emergency response and first aid plans really become our backup plan. So it, the, the, we, we know that we're not going to protect 100% of the people. That means for those that we're not protecting, we need to be able to act quickly when um, uh, an illness emerges. So it's the recognition of and first aid for, and I'm going to emphasize exertional heat related disorders. I, at the uh, end of these couple of slides, we'll, we'll mention a couple of that are not uh, related to the physical demands of the work, but, but, but are occupational. And again, I've provided a handout that summarizes some of these. And, and I encourage people I work with to have some variation of this available at the work site to help guide the, uh, the response to heat-related disorders. So mild heat exhaustion. Uh, this is really where somebody uh, can be uh, dehydrated uh, with, it doesn't have adequate uh, fluid replacement. Uh, it may be uh, for other reasons as well. Generally, they have a cardiovascular system that is somewhat compromised. Uh, and we're going to rely on the symptoms that they may report. So a, a, a person may say they feel tired or fatigued. They'll report that they're thirsty, uh, weak and dizzy, lightheaded. Um, if there's a rapid change in uh, posture, they, they may report a faintness and also muscle cramps. So we're gonna put this as the lower end of uh, the kinds of signs and symptoms that, that require some intervention. So first of all, it's going to be the individual worker who's going to sense this. Um, somebody may also see um, this in somebody. They ought to inform a supervisor and then recovery in a cool area and uh, replacing fluids. Um, almost always these kinds of uh, symptoms of mild heat exhaustion uh, will correct relatively quickly once they've had an opportunity to rest and uh, replace uh, water. Um, if the symptoms persist more than 15 minutes, then we we believe that it, that this isn't uh, a, a case of mild heat exhaustion. Now, now something really significant is going on. So stepping up one step to a severe heat exhaustion uh, is uh, again a person going to the bomb part. A person may say they have not only fatigue, but severe fatigue. They'll just really report, I'm very, very tired. Um, I, I've seen in a number of cases that I've investigated and it's, it's reported in the literature, but a loss of appetite. So you'll also see that people with severe heat exhaustion are not drinking as much as they should. They, they've lost that desire to do it. They may skip a meal or just kind of pick a little bit at their meal, but not eat. Um, 
and that's a loss of appetite. And of course, if they're feeling any nausea, they're, they're not uh, likely to eat or drink. They will also report headaches and, and blurred vision. Um, what becomes a little different in severe heat exhaustion versus mild is now somebody else is going to start seeing things in this person, independent of what they may report. But they'll be very unsteady in their walking. There, there will be noticeably slower reaction times. Uh, I, again, um, they're, they, they are going to be uh, sitting down or laying down uh, with severe fatigue. Uh, they, they may, in fact, be suffering from severe muscle cramps and, 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 um, and if you've ever seen somebody, they, they, they just are in pain and uh, they grasp the muscles that are cramping. And of course, if there's vomiting or collapse, uh, even without any other signs of heat stroke, you should treat this as um, a severe heat exhaustion. Again, you wanna cool them down, encourage uh, drinking if they're able. Uh, now, a, a trick that the sports people have taught me is that if you cover their heads and shoulders with a, a, a cold towel, such as soaked in ice water, um, this helps them to cool down, gets a little bit more blood back into the central nervous system. And then this becomes a little bit of a test about whether it's heat exhaustion or in fact might be a heat stroke. I, the uh, further you watch for signs of heat stroke because it's, it, it's not unusual for a severe heat exhaustion to continue to move up to a heat stroke. And again, if there's little improvement in 15 minutes and especially with this little trick, then it's time to um, arrange for medical treatment. So at this point, um, they should be transported to uh, an emergency department and you're looking for the possibility of, of uh, heat stroke. And then in my final slide here are heat strokes. Uh, and I put signs and, and the, the, the word symptoms is missing for a reason. It's unlikely anybody will come up and report symptoms of a heat stroke. At this point, you're really relying on other people to observe uh, the, the signs of a heat stroke and then take action. So if we got here because of severe fatigue or nausea, uh, you just want to uh, sit, uh, you know, as you're, as you're treating the, the heat exhaustion, look for these other features. But what's different from heat exhaustions and heat stroke is heat exhaustions involve the cardiovascular system. Heat stroke is now a failure of the central nervous system. So something has now gone wrong in the brain. And so you're looking for those kinds of things that are associated with, uh, with, uh, with the brain malfunctioning. So erratic and irritable behavior, confusion and disorientation. I've been in a couple of cases where people have quit the job and just walked off the site and died of heat stroke. I saw another case where somebody was walking through a warehouse, not knowing which, where they were supposed to be. I've seen a couple of cases where they start just talking gibberish. They, they're speaking uh, without saying words or having any meaning. So boy, any of those things that tell you that something's wrong with the brain, uh, you have to uh, begin to, to, to deal with them. I have not personally in the cases I've been involved in seeing the historia delirium and apathy, but these are all uh, also uh, the possibility that, that to come with heat stroke. I have uh, seen in case studies collapse, um, uh, a shivering I have not, but a, again, it's that the, the central nervous system now doesn't believe that it's hot and then, of course, convulsions and unconsciousness, which seen a number of times. 
So if you see these, you just have to say, we've got a heat stroke. That means we have an emergency response. We have to begin aggressive cooling. Um, and I can't emphasize this enough. The body core temperature is too high and you have to do anything you can to begin to lower that body temperature as quickly as possible. And the, the absolute best way is to cover them in ice or, or place them in, a, in an ice water bath. But any other method of getting them cool, putting them, dunking them into water, flushing water over them, whatever water is available and how, you can, and how you can cool them, you ought to do it. And then call the emergency service and advise them that they're likely to be dealing with a heat stroke case because you cannot wait to get to the hospital to deal with the heat stroke. It has to be started right away. And of course, for, and again, this is more my experience working in the United States, uh, where we've had problems is, is um, landscaping crews that move around to different areas. Uh, it, so it's important that you know where you are so that you can report to the emergency services exactly where you are. So, uh, and as I mentioned before, in that handout is, is a map that I've just, uh, similar to the one I've just laid out. Other heat related disorders, uh, common to occupational exposures or heat syncopes, this is uh, a fainting. And I see these in peculiar places. I, I, I haven't been able to get a map in my own mind of what it is about jobs that, that are related to heat syncope. Uh, usually it's those jobs that have very static postures or very rapid changes in postures. But one of the places that I saw that had the most frequent um, uh, prevalent cases of heat syncope actually didn't have those characteristics. Um, heat cramps, again, in, in muscles that are tired are more susceptible. And then heat rashes are associated with uh, infected um, uh, sweat glands that, that then will emerge into a, a dermatitis. So moving on, so on notes on recognition and treatment, you need to act early and uh, err to the side of thinking there's a problem where none exists. Uh, this is especially true for heat stroke, but true for the others as well. Uh, the heat stroke does depend upon the early recognition of signs. A again, somebody's not gonna come up and tell you I'm having a heat stroke. Somebody has to be aware of their coworker or a supervisor has to be aware. And then if any worker experiences a feigning uh, spell or other form of collapse, they should seek me medical advice because it might not be a syncope, it could very well be an underlying um, medical disorder that just uh, happened to be associated with a heat stress exposure. Finally, in terms of uh, policies, uh, the, uh, there are really two. One is, uh, I've already mentioned that self-determination is a hygiene practice, so the individual needs to do this to protect themselves. But uh, a lot of places that I've consulted with have informal policies. In other words, supervisors say, yeah, we, we really do encourage people to take a break but I think it needs to be reinforced as a written policy. And then remember that work incentives discourage um, breaks. Uh, the other thing that we see is um, um, in new workers is that they're more susceptible, uh, they're more likely to have a heat related illness and I, uh, and I sometimes wonder if, in fact, not sometimes, I often wonder if it's not a work incentive, not necessarily in terms of pay, but trying to keep up with more capable workers 
who are used to doing that job or trying to uh, impress a supervisor, uh, especially if they feel that their job in the first few days is uh, uh, that they're there for a review and they, and they, they may not be hired. Uh, acclimatization is, a, is a, a, a known, very well established physiological improvement in heat stress tolerance. Um, in the United States, there's a lot of attention, attention in the enforcement area to push acclimatization. I'm a, a little bit uh, uncertain how appropriate or, or uh, that there's an overemphasis on acclimatization to other things that, that they may want to be paying attention to. So I personally like a, a policy that provides for a recognition and an adjustment of work without making it a formal schedule. But there are formal schedules for acclimatization. And basically, it takes somebody who's unacclimatized uh, about a week to get sufficiently uh, adjusted that they're getting the major improvements. There will be some further improvements in the second week, but not as, as much as you'll get in those first few days. Um, historically, a new worker was brought up more slowly. Uh, appreciate a bit that this idea was developed in the context of, of uh, working in relatively dangerous environments, learning a new job, and where uh, simple mistakes on that job can lead to serious injuries. Uh, and so there was a more cautious approach to allowing people to get used to the heat at the same time that they were learning to deal with a new job. I think for practical purposes, if, the, if it's a relatively unskilled job, that, that the, the cautions necessary here are probably less so, and you can follow the experience path. Then over a period of up to three weeks, we will lose uh, acclimatization. So if you're away for about three weeks from no heat exposures at all, um, then a full uh, reacclimatization is appropriate. Uh, interestingly enough, if you're away from work and ill, in other words, you have a fever, uh, the vomiting and diarrhea, things that we've talked about for acute illness, you lose that acclimatization very, very quickly. So illness, as opposed to an injury or a vacation, it has something that affects the body fundamentally differently and the acclimatization goes away much more quickly. Uh, finally, training. And I put training at the, the end, not because training is the least important of all of these, but it's because training takes all of these different elements and brings them together for the worker, all right? So the, uh, it should be at least annually um, in, uh, with follow-up refreshers I, where there's already uh, training for other hazards associated with their work, whether it's in the informal economy or, or small employers or large employers, that the training format should be, it can be the same. Um, heat stress alerts are helpful, especially, you know, we're beginning, we've always appreciated them. It's a sudden change in temperature, but with climate change, we are seeing now more frequent rapid changes in temperature. And that really essentially means the workers are unacclimatized to that hotter environment so that their risks are higher. Um, what training should include is like any sort of occupational training. What's the hazard? Uh, what can happen to you with that hazard? What can you do to help yourself? Uh, and then, of course, what uh, 
what countermeasures are um, on the uh, on the work site and that you need to know about so that you can take appropriate actions on it. Um, I'll, uh, I'll mention now that, uh, of course, there are other controls. So there's a traditional hierarchy of engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protection. And I'll come back to those in, in, a, in a short uh, while. Um, Dr. Denny, uh, once again, what I'm going to do, this is a, a kind of the overview, I think, of what were some very important things. I have many more slides that are of a much more detailed nature. Um, uh, and I'll probably move through them a little bit more closely. So it's for those who have a deep interest in heat stress and want to know a little bit more, I'll cover those issues. But if there's any questions about the, you know, what I think are the kinds of things that just generally apply to all exposures, I, I think now would be an appropriate time for questions. Yes, Dr. Bernard, there are some questions over here from YouTube and from the chat. The first question comes from Dr. Baju by Yui Jazena. What is the difference between uh, wet bulb uh, globe temperature and heat index? And that's the first question. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and, and I'll preface that by saying that I'm very much a fan of the wet bulb globe temperature. Uh, but the heat index is more easily measured and they're related so that you can do a crosswalk from one to the other. And so I'm more and more talking about heat index is a more commonly available method that people can use. And that's the reason I've started to map out um, equivalent heat indices. I hope that answers the question. Yes, I think it's quite clear, crystal clear. And then um, from Rizki Maharja, thank you, Prof. Prof. I'm Kiki from Academy Pelgas Makassar. Can you tell us how to do heat stress assessment if we don't have VGBT method? Is it good to use pulse recovery after work? Yes. So. This becomes, and, you know, and if somebody's interested in this, I don't mind working with them at some other time. Um, you, WBGT, as I just said, is a very good way to assess, it because it maps human responses to heat. Um, but in the absence of the equipment, there are, um, ways to estimate WBGT depending upon what, what you have available or you can use the heat index. And if the um, dew point or the water vapor pressure is relatively constant, uh, there's ways of just using simply dry bulb temperature. So it depends upon how well you know your environment you can do a fairly good assessment in a relatively simple way, but it takes some thought and knowledge. It, it can't be done casually. Okay. Okay. So, Baris, Bariski, apakah sudah terjawab? So, WGBT. Uh, if if you don't have WGBT, but you need memerlukan lebih apa pengenalan yang lebih yang lebih skillful untuk pulse recovery. Bagaimana Mbak Rizky? Okay. So we can can we move to the next question? So prof from Ihda Taftazani. Pak Ihda ini ya. Apa Ibu Ihda? Prof, do you see the nature of tropical climate just like Indonesia compared to the US for a season country? in heat stroke occurrence um, as I'm dealing. Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so some of the data I see in uh, is, so I don't, I, I have not seen data from tropical countries that I can make the, the, the same as a, a, a comparison. 
So we, we do know that there are heat strokes. We do know that the tropical com, uh, countries um, tend to be driven more by humidity than by other factors. Um, and we'll talk about it quickly as we go through the other slides, but it's the ability to evaporate sweat to the environment that's really the most important thing for uh, preventing uh, heat illness. And in a tropical environment, that becomes very hard. Um, he also asked whether the, uh, how to deal with the design, engineering design of the building, because he's, uh, as I'm dealing with some furnace at plants and now being an engineering design of the building, and then the master design of Europe cannot be applied in Indonesia as the humidity and temperature is different. Yes. And part of what I think I may go back to is, um, is providing small areas with air conditioning. So if you can, um, so I'm, I'm not going to suggest air conditioning large areas, but I'll suggest that having recovery areas that are air conditioned have a very great advantage to helping to manage heat stress. And the air conditioning helps to remove the water vapor from the air. Uh, so it makes it a drier environment that allows, again, more sweat evaporation. So it allows a period to catch up. Okay. So um, for me, I have a concern of Many people, including myself, have a habit on switching on the air conditioner as soon as we reach the home or in the car because we want to get comfortable uh, temperature. So do you think is there any consequences on this uh, habit? Uh, so no, you, you, the, there's no consequence to moving quickly to a cool environment. Um, what we have observed in occupational settings that if the recovery area is very cool, is that is that they'll stop working and go sit somewhere outside the cool break room before they go into the break room. So providing a very cold environment doesn't help them. It doesn't hurt them, but you're not going okay. to get the advantage. So I often will suggest that the, um, that the break room be about a 20 degree C WBGT, uh, which would be about uh, a room temperature of 27 degrees C. Oh, Celsius. Yeah, maybe a little cooler. I, 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 I'm sorry, but I can't make that shift from Fahrenheit to, uh, so, no uh, if you were in the US. So, uh, you know, a, a room temperature, a, a, a cool, comfortable room temperature in an office building would be about okay. as low as you want to go. Yeah, it's 24 to 26 uh, degrees Celsius. Yes. Okay. And then um, from Mas uh, Irwan Risnadar. Good morning or good evening, Dr. Bonner. Beside monitoring the sign and symptoms of a worker, can we also work on monitoring the sign and symptom of the heat stroke by monitoring their body temperature by using a body thermometer or as we are using now, a handheld handgun body th thermometer? Yeah. So the simple answer is no. Um, there, there might be some use for monitoring body temperature, but the clinical diagnosis of heat stroke requires a rectal temperature, uh, an oral temperature or an axillary temperature or an ear temperature uh, will give you a false reading. It, 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 it it needs to be a deep body temperature. Okay. 
So it, it, the only way it can be easily monitored, well, it's not easily monitored. The only way it can be monitored in the field is to use one of these capsules that are swallowed and then transmits out the temperature. Those are very expensive. And in some countries are also not socially acceptable. Indeed. So there, there isn't a good way in the field to know if somebody has a heat stroke. Okay. Other than the, the, the signs. And then you let the hospital make the diagnosis. Okay. So that's the low cost solutions. Uh, do you mean that is the, the lowest cost solution? Uh, pardon me, I didn't understand the question. Uh, I mean, if there is no, um, excuse me, if the, um, if there is no experts or equipments to judge the heat stress, what do you think? Is there any low cost solution for this? Yeah. So, you know, I think, uh, if, Providing advice about the temperature and humidity and the effects, uh, I think providing at least that, that kind of temperature and humidity combination that you really need to be worried about uh, is useful information. So I think that just that first piece of information provides you with an awful lot to go with. And then rely on the... Uh, the self-discretion of workers that, 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 that they are doing well, that there's good supervision or good mutual watching of each other. Um, it, you know, with, again, the good training and the good hygiene practices, I think that does a lot. Um, I, 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 I didn't want to quite come out and say that in the slides, but Again, if you're if you're going into the informal sector, I think just letting them know that heat is very problematic and the things that they can do to help prevent it, and and especially watch for it in others, is critically important. Yep, this is the problem of uh, some of many informal sectors uh, relating to the question from. Uh, Ida Wahyuni, uh, one of our faculty members. Yes. Uh, yeah. And again, the oil and gas industry is going to be very comfortable with everything that I've said. They, <laughs> they, they already know it. <laughs> yeah. But unresolved pro problem for us is when we deal with the informal sector workers and informal sector businesses. And, you know, I don't have as much experience as you do with that. But, but I, again, I, I think that these concepts we talked about in this first hour, the, you know, how you can translate it to that sector is going to be very helpful. Thank you. We'll do that. And then, uh, what, uh, there is no name, but this is from... Um, Master of Health Promotion Administration that mengapa disebut traditional hierarchy of control apakah hierarchy pengendalian yang berbeda uh, why is it called the traditional of hierarchy of control and then is there any a uh, modern or different uh, hierarchy of control um, so the two things. One is that there are the, 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 the name hierarchy of controls is common. It's been expanded um, mm -hmm. a bit. I, I stick with the traditional because I think it for heat stress expresses it well. Uh, and some of the others don't immediately apply. Um, so I, you know, using a more expanded hierarchy, I think confuses the discussion. Uh, 
the importance in that order is engineering controls will either eliminate the hazard or reduce it and does it in a way that's inherent uh, an inherent reduction so that's good all right it doesn't rely on the worker to do anything administrative controls is less desirable because you're you're allowing the hazard to exist uh, and what you're trying to do is manage the exposures by work practices uh, so there's there's a bit more risk associated with administrative controls over engineering controls. Personal cooling is uh, is more generally uh, personal protective equipment is the lowest of the hierarchy of controls because that relies totally on the individual to do it. And generally, if if there's a failure of that equipment, then there's an exposure, all right? So the, that's, the re, that's the traditional hierarchy that's been around since the, the 1960s. And the reason for the, uh, the preference for, for engineering controls first and personal protection last. You know, in the days of uh, the uh, COVID-19, if you can increase the ventilation and uh, so that you've managed the virus by taking it away, that's better than saying we're going to have everybody in face masks, which may leak, uh, they may contaminate themselves, right? Uh, so it, it becomes a less reliable barrier. The same thing is true in the general hierarchy. Not a perfect okay. example, but just a draw. <laughs> yeah, it might be dangerous too. <laughs> and then um, the next question is that, is there any procedure and, st and standard to make an acclimatization room? Yeah, so I, I provided the schedule and then there is following that schedule, you can, um, you can manage it in an area appropriate to uh, your work site. The schedule was mapped out as 50%, 60%. So it's a percent of what somebody would be able to do if they were fully acclimatized. So if you will, if, if they're working, you know, if the acclimatized person's working an hour, you want the unacclimatized to work half that time kind of thing. But there really are better ways of doing it. You just give them a job that requires a lower metabolic rate. So an example of that, that was just a, in a recent uh, case I consulted on, was that there was somebody who is new to a landscaping operation. So the, the new person managed the traffic. So told cars, you know, held cars back or let them go uh, while the other people were doing the manually demanding work, All right? So that's another way of trying to introduce somebody to a hot environment. Thank you. Yeah. And then there is another question from Dr. Sisu Jayanti. Is there any side effect for the heat stroke management to just wrap in the with the wet towel? Uh, okay, and again, I'm sorry, but the, there was a little bit of noise. Could you repeat the question again? Okay, is there any side effect of um, heat stroke uh, treatment by wrapping with the wet towel. Yeah, uh, so no, there's no side effects um, from the the treatments that I suggested. All right, the um, the the side effect from heat stroke um, will be that there can be uh, permanent organ damage uh, if it's not treated. So the very aggressive cooling helps to, um, to uh, uh, 
control that risk of, of having denatured proteins that, that uh, interfere with kidney function or may cause strokes. So there's, there's a lot that starts to go on that you want to prevent. And providing the cold towel or, or even the immersion in cold water um, is not going to cause any damage. Okay. okay. But the not doing it can cause damage. Okay, thank you. So that is a question. Next question from Deswita Dri Artanti. Hi, Prof. Bernard. I'm Deswita, the environmental health safety practitioner. So she is interested in knowing more about how the current practice in the U.S. on preventing heat stress in outdoor sector activities such as road construction, garden maintenance, and extra. And would you please share us about that? A, is there any combination of sun protection, clothing, and proper rehydration will help? Okay, that was a long list of, uh, of questions. I, and I may come back to ask for the latter ones. In outdoor yeah. work, um, it, it, managing the heat is, is difficult. Um, the, uh, uh, it, we rely on rest to help lower the metabolic rate so that demands to, to dissipate that heat to the environment go down. Um, we, uh, in the United States, have an emphasis on moving into shady areas when you take your rest breaks and, and get something to drink. Um, getting out of the sun is helpful, but it's not a really large effect. Um, that's why uh, it, it, it becomes difficult to manage in an open space where you can't bring in um, environmental controls, uh, it, you know, like a, a temporary cooling tent or something like that. Um, the, and then what was the other part of the question? Uh, it's a combination of sun protection, clothing, and proper rehydration will help. Yeah, the, the sun, the, so the sun protection doesn't help much. Okay. Uh, we, of course, want to protect people from uh, ultraviolet light from the sun. So mm. wearing light fitting, uh, loose fitting white clothing uh, helps from, from that point of view. I've told you that, that providing shade, um, it, it helps more with comfort, but, but less so with heat stress. Okay. Yep. Okay. And was there anything else in that question? Um, I, this one. Any other any other control measure required? Uh, any other control measure required? Okay. I, I'm not sure I understood the, the, the question, but it's, it, again, what you, you know, your goal is to manage the heat exposures so that there's, there's not a heat related illness. Um, if, if all of the other controls are in place, I think then the, the critical element is that you're prepared to recognize an exertional heat illness and then treat it, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and that just becomes more and more a requirement. And again, I, I, I'm pushing that one down to the informal sector more than oil and gas, that they should have the resources to manage this, this okay. But where you don't have the resources to control the environment as well as you would like. I think you need to appreciate that there are risks 
and that the fact that you live in a tropical environment doesn't give you a higher level of heat tolerance than anybody else anywhere else. There, there are no ethnic or racial differences in the ability to tolerate heat around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and the next question from Ilham, also a uh, health, safety, environment practitioner. practitioner. He is asking about is the electrolyte electrolytes uh, beverage could help to uh, prevent the heat stroke? Uh, no, what's critical is uh, drinking the water and people will drink more of the electrolyte drinks than they will of water alone. So that's what's important about electrolyte drinks. Um, oh. There's an argument for some heat exhaustions and, and heat cramps that if you drink an electrolyte drink, that the, it'll help relieve the cramps and might help improve a little bit the uh, heat exhaustion. The, um, the problem with the heat exhaustion is, is, is you still need to move, you need to get fluids from the, uh, from the gut out into the blood volume. And, um, and uh, the, the, the water will move as quickly as an electrolyte drink. You don't want to take salty water, all right? So a commercial electrolyte drink is very carefully balanced. Don't try to make your own. Okay. Okay. So, only commercial one is recommended, right, Dr. Bernard? Yeah. Or just water? Uh, well, it, I would rec I would recommend electrolyte drinks, right? And I recommend electrolyte drinks. drinks, not because there are electrolytes in them, but because people drink more of it. So they okay. drink more water. All right. Okay. And and that's just been demonstrated over and over again. Okay. So I think all questions are already answered and um we can move to the next slide, Dr. Right. Bernard. I, I'm going to tell you to brace yourself because we have, uh, well, I don't know, something about 85 slides or so. And uh, what do we have? About uh, 40 minutes. So yep. uh, I will move quickly. Okay. All right. But again, I think. We talked about the important issues and we had, I think, good questions. Okay, so for heat stress, um, for occupational heat stress, I wanna talk a little bit about heat stress and strain, a little bit about exposure assessment and some about the hierarchy of controls, okay? With a little bit more detail. Um, in terms of heat flow, heat stress is a problem of taking internally generated heat from the metabolic demands of work, moving it to the skin, and then getting it out to the environment by sweat evaporation. So the critical path is metabolic heat out by sweat evaporation. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on the heat balance equation other than the, 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 re the real issue is that to prevent heat storage, uh, we, ha we have an increase in metabolic rate and we dissipate it by sweat evaporation. And then I'm just going to uh, kind of skip through these slides because that's in the end, the major message and that clothes will have a role in this. All right, uh, so in the end, the message is what makes the environment hot, it's high humidity. It's because that affects the ability to move heat by sweat evaporation from the body out to the environment, much, much less so as at hot surfaces or, or higher temperature. Uh, clothing is going to play an important role. So it's it, 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 to the extent that the clothing inhibits or reduces the rate of sweat evaporation, it's going to influence um, the, uh, 
the the ability to tolerate heat. So it's primarily the 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 how much air movement. So the convective permissibility is in the end the, the big factor. Um, so the job risk factors are the environment, and it's especially the humidity. It's the work demands, and especially it's the metabolic demands, and it's the evaporative resistance of the clothing. So it's, it's environment, work, and clothing. In terms of physiological responses, uh, heart rate's going to go up in order to move the blood from the, the, the core out to the skin. Uh, sweat rate's going to increase in order to evaporate that off the skin. And core temperature is going to increase a little bit to facilitate the heat transfer, uh, but you wish that it, you hope that it reaches a steady level uh, and that, that the, uh, the heart rate and, and sweat evaporation uh, are able to move the heat. Uh, in terms of the physiological systems, it's their neurological. I talked a lot about the cardiovascular, skin sweating, and it's uh, water and electrolyte balance. And I'm going to skip these. This is a climatization. We've talked about this several times now. Um, what happens, and, and, and as I said, this is just an amazing process. I, you know, have acclimatized. Uh, you know, a hundred subjects uh, and, and watch this with uh, fascination. But on, on day one, their body temperature and heart rates are really high. They probably can't go the whole time. And by the time they get out several days, they, they are, the, that physiological strain is down by a lot. And by the time you're out two weeks, they've, they, there's no further benefit. And where, and what allows that to happen is the fact that sweat rate increases over that same period of time, right? So really the benefits of acclimatization is an earlier onset of sweating. So you start to get that heat out sooner. You, it's a greater rate of sweating so that you can get more and more uh, cooling. And it's also a more dilute sweat. In other words, you're conserving the electrolytes or in the sweat and you're almost just putting out pure water. The result is that lower cardiovascular strain and a lower uh, body core temperature. Uh, personal risk factors uh, are, again, a lot of inter-individual variations and a lot of variability. And this is day-to-day -day variability among individuals. Uh, the more fit somebody is, the more likely they can tolerate heat. Um, age and sex are associated, but they're probably associated through aerobic capacity. Obesity is clearly linked. Uh, and again, diseases um, that affect the ability to thermal regulate, and then any sort of drugs uh, that uh, may affect thermal regulation. So all of these are risk factors associated with the person and not the job. I, I picked on heat stroke here to, to remind you there's all sorts of things that will uh, predispose somebody. So over time, uh, external pacing, uh, piecework or a new worker, uh, heat wave and the preceding exposure, and then, you know, whether they're not acclimatized or they're sick or there's a, um, a, a obesity or lack of sleep, drug abuse, or all things that, that will predispose somebody to uh, um, heat stroke. Uh, if you were looking at first aid records, you would see people coming to the clinic with excessive fatigue, nausea, headache, and then rashes, cramps, and elevated uh, temperatures. Uh, now for the measurement of heat stress, and we heard about WBGT. Uh, so WB, if you look at the dry bulb temperature, that's just the air temperature, what we all will report. Um, if you put a wetted wick over a dry bulb thermometer, uh, water will evaporate off that wick and it will cool. And if you put a fan in front of that wick, it'll cool even further. So 
it's uh, the amount of sweat evaporation that the environment will support is the natural wet bulb. And then the globe temperature looks at the uh, radiant and convective heat exchanges between the environment and the person. So this leads then to the um, WBGT, which is the wet bulb globe temperature, and it's seven tenths of the natural wet bulb temperature. So that's our ability to evaporatively cool. And then three tenths is globe temperature, which is that other kinds of heat exchanges that are going on that are much less important. There's a little bit of a variation in globe temperature, uh, WBGT, if you're in direct sunlight, not shade, but direct sunlight and that the globe temperature overestimates the uh, radiant heat gain. So we, we discount it a little bit by taking a 10th out of globe and moving it over to air temperature. So WBGT reflects the air temperature, humidity, hot surfaces, and air motion. Uh, what I haven't told you anywhere is that WBGT also maps very well the physiological capacity to deal with heat. So that, so that an isotherm of WBGT also represents um, a, a, a constant physiological response to different, level, different kinds of heat. Uh, we assess metabolic rate a number of ways. The, the, the most frequent is just a metabolic rate category. Is it light, moderate, heavy, or very heavy? And I'm fine with those. I do that myself. Uh, you, the only thing you have to do is be careful um, that um, you're really talking about um, uh, the rate of work appropriate to what's going on. And oftentimes, people will call it heavy or very heavy work because there's a small period of time where they're doing that kind of work, but they're not averaging it out with time where they're not working at all. So in practice, it's very seldom do you see um, a metabolic rate over the course of a half an hour, an hour that's, that's greater than 300 watts. So, uh, you know, I'll caution anybody that if you classify a job as greater than moderate, you really have to think, is it really that kind of work sustained for long periods of time? And even in cool environments, people will have a very difficult time keeping up with this kind of work without taking a break. Um, the ISO uh, provides a more rigorous method of estimating, uh, and, and this standard's uh, undergone a couple of iterations, and there's a new one coming out as well uh, about uh, estimating metabolic rate. But I like it, this method, and it's actually the one I use when I'm assessing jobs. The other thing we need to do is, is we've got the, with the environment in WBGT, we've got metabolic rate as, a, as an estimate. Uh, and then the other is how do we adjust for clothing? And basically the, the threshold for moderate work and work clothes is 28 degrees CWBGT. But what if I'm wearing vapor barrier clothing? That's going to affect how much heat I can give up and so how, what's, what does that WBGT look like if I'm wearing protective clothing? And so we have a clothing adjustment um, values that are published and, and I've got more extensive lists if anybody's interested, uh, write and, and I'd be happy to provide it. But basically woven clothing is, it requires no adjustment. A double layer cloth clothing would be three degrees. And if you were in vapor barrier coveralls, I would tell you with a hood, I would tell you it's about 11 degrees. So it effectively is much hotter. So the effect of WBGT is whatever is measured plus the adjustment value gives you the effect of WBGT. And then you have to do a time-weighted average over an hour or two. 
that looks at the any time variation in WBGT, any variation in metabolic rate. And then it's those two that you will base your exposure assessment on. Right. Um, so I want to come back now and talk a bit about how it is that the, the current WBGT exposure limits came to be. And, and basically, uh, it, the idea is control body core temperature. So Lynn did a number of studies where he exposed people to an hour's worth of heat and looked for those points where they could level out. And then notice that there were points where there was a significantly higher body core temperature. He plotted those out and said, you know what, if we control right through this region here, that will be the upper limit of the prescriptive zone. So if we're below that limit, we can maintain thermal equilibrium very easily, independent of the environment. And if we're above the upper limit, we enter a, an environmentally driven zone. Um, and so that really, that study, which was only two subjects, is became the basis for the WBGT systems. And it's really maintaining thermal equilibrium. There's nobody asking a question, does it cause heat related disorders? Um, Lynn went back to confirm the, his upper limit of the prescriptive zone at one metabolic rate. And what he found was if he was just below that limit, most people could do it. And if he was just above that limit, he'd start to see large numbers of people who couldn't do it. And if he were higher above, even more people. So that idea that there's an exposure response starts to come out in this discussion here. Uh, he went back and did a couple of more studies that uh, looked at the effects of aging and uh, continuous versus intermittent work. And it came to the same basic same conclusion. Um, in a, an associated study done later, Kohlmeier uh, examined uh, 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 exposures well above the up, up or limited the uh, prescriptive zone and below, and found in fact that people could reach a steady state below and could not reach a steady state above. Uh, so the overall conclusions are when we look at group-based outcomes from Lyndon Kohlmeier is if we're below the upper limit of the prescriptive zone, which is our occupational exposure limit, they're sustainable. And then the idea is that there's people who can't maintain that um, exposure above. Uh, with a little bit more explanation, below the upper limit of the prescriptive zone, virtually everybody can have a sustainable exposure, and that's good. Above, many individuals still have a sustainable exposure. It's just the fewer of them, the higher you get up. So there's high sensitivity and really the way kind of they chose their data, good specificity. This became the occupational exposure limit. Uh, and then there was an adjustment based for unacclimatized workers that basically lowered it about three degrees C. So this plot shows the occupational exposure limit for acclimatized individuals and unacclimatized. So we do make that distinction for that one personal factor. Uh, at USF, we went back and we, we, uh, we had a, an extensive set of studies that we were able to more closely distinguish between sustainable and unsustainable. And when we looked at our data, we had a, a receiver operator characteristic curve of this sort. Um, it, what's important to note is that now we're getting, when we select something with good sensitivity, we get relatively poor specificity. Um, and when we look at that, uh, and here's the exposure response curve. So it's about a 1% probability, and it's a 1% probability of an exposure. So it's, it's not a person, um, it's, it's a combination of, of people and uh, an exposure on a given day. But, uh, but certainly acceptable. Uh, as we move, this is the curve shifts this way 
we, we get significantly uh, higher risk for uncontrolled exposures and um, the anaclimatized shift the curve this way. Uh, when we look at the sensitivity and specificity of all three investigators, they're all very good. Uh, the difference between the high, relatively good specificity for Lynn and Kohlmeyer were that they chose exposures relatively far apart. So it was either going to be in one or the other. Uh, in USF, we, we, we chose our exposures closer together so that we were getting more noise on the, um, on the uh, uh, where we were getting um, unsustainable exposures uh, that were in fact below the uh, occupational exposure limit. Uh, in conclusion then, the, the occupational exposure limit has high sensitivity uh, but very low specificity, which means a high rate of false positives. But remember that the odds of being unsustainable become progressively higher with increasing heat stress. So the, our margin of safety is not that great because it's not hard to get a variation of a couple of degrees CWBGT. Uh, in terms of the control of heat stress, uh, it's uh, there's a progressive nature. We can be thermally comfortable, and I and I hope that you all are comfortable in your environment. Uh, <coughs> as the temperature and humidity and other factors increase, we may move into a region of discomfort. If we keep progressing, we'll we'll move into a region that's a health risk. Okay, the occupational exposure limit is meant to control this border. In other words, we will allow people to be uncomfortable, but what we're trying to manage is the uh, health risk. Uh, so I'm going to come down into the, the final set of, of uh, slides. Um, and just to give you a kind of count, we're probably about 30 slides away from the, uh, from the end. But an integrated program, we talked a bit about continuous improvement processes uh, yesterday, but setting policy, setting responsibilities and monitoring, and then general controls and specific controls are the two things I want to uh, talk about for a moment. First of all, for general controls, I really talked about these earlier, so I'm not going to go back and repeat them all again, other than to remind you, I didn't call them general controls at the time, but I think you just try to implement these as best as you can anytime you are willing to say you have a heat exposure. There's the hygiene practices, surveillance, and critically the, the emergency response plan. Uh, policies as they would be appropriate, and then training. Now, the job-specific controls are really those things when you're going to exceed the occupational exposure limit for acclimatized workers. Um, uh, in which case, again, it, we're going to talk about the, um, the, the traditional hierarchy, and I'm going to just elaborate a little bit more on why I think those are important. So uh, you'll recall heat balance, but you're going to recall heat balance only in the sense that I went through about 10 slides in, in as many seconds. But the message is that you generate heat inside the body and you have to dissipate it out by evaporation. So you're going to have a required evaporative cooling that's going to be equal to the metabolic rate. And then radiation and convection generally represent 10% or less of uh, that side of the equation. So it, they're relatively minor. So when we look to engineering controls, uh, reducing the metabolic rate is the greatest contributor. The problem is to reduce the metabolic rate, you need to start talking about mechanization. So you, instead of supplying human power, you have to start up supplying a, uh, 
electrical or pneumatic or um, uh, you know a gas power, some external power source. Um, the changes in clothing requirements, uh, and again, more for the oil and gas industry than the informal economy, but. The uh, sometimes we overprotect people and adjusting the clothing requirements to more balance the protection is helpful. And, I, and, and uh, the other point on this slide is that they can be temporary or permanent controls depending upon the kinds of uh, exposures you have. So clothing uh, you know, really balances requirements. So I got a little bit fancy with this slide, but basically you're going to have chemical exposures or, or exposures to physical agents. You're going to have to decide on protective clothing that's going to provide the barrier that's going to be adequate. But once you start talking about that, you need to start asking, okay, and, and what effect does that have on heat stress? So I've done a lot of work in the nuclear power industry. And one of the things that they were very um, concerned about were skin contaminations. And yet what they realized was that skin contaminations in fact don't represent a health risk but it was um, a, a performance metric. How well did your health physics program work? And once they began to appreciate that, that, that they were preventing skin contaminations by putting people into excessive levels of protective clothing and causing then problems with heat stress, they began to recognize that they needed to be less restrictive with the protective clothing in order to protect them from, from the heat. Okay, uh, clothing uh, uh, affects uh, work time. So uh, this is an environment, it's not exactly tropical, but it's it, but an environment that's uh, 35 degrees C, 60% relative humidity. So it's typical of the, uh, um, Gulf Coast of the United States uh, and working at uh, uh, about 350 watts, a little bit higher than that moderate that I described to you before. People wearing cotton clothing uh, on average could go out almost two hours. Uh, wearing a wicking kind of, um, um, of a garment, uh, a, a little bit less time. And then finally, when you went got to a vapor barrier garment that they could only go a half an hour. So huge differences in the ability to perform. I expressed in a different way, and this is where I really began to appreciate the value of the convective component of clothing is that as you increase the air permeability of the clothing ensemble, you can, this is treadmill speed, but you basically can increase uh, productivity or or said another way, evaporative cooling with uh, greater air permeability. Now, administrative controls, remember I talked that we don't eliminate the exposure. What we're trying now to do is manage the risk. And there's a couple of ways that are typical of thinking about that. One, excuse me, our uh, work rest cycles. Another is a, a planned work time. And then of course, self-determination. Um, so when we look at work and recovery, this is for outdoor work where recovery is in the shade, right? So this is a typical recommended practice in the United States. And notice for a moderate rate of work, the green line, you can, you can go up to about a 28 degree CWBGT. That's uh, got a, sh a little bit cooler than the, those experiments that I described to you before uh, at 35 degrees and 60% relative humidity. But notice as you get higher and higher, you need to spend, by the time you get marginally up 
to 31 or so. So just a, a couple of degrees higher, uh, you have to start spending half your time in the shade and half working. So you can see where productivity drops off very quickly. Um, but that's how work rest cycles work. If we were to work in a cooled area, which is the reason why I keep saying cooled areas, notice that by the time you get up to where work would have to stop if you were just taking your rest in the shade is that you could be working for 40 minutes out of an hour. So that really points toward having a cool recovery area. And I've consulted with a number of businesses that set up uh, temporary tents with air conditioning systems to help meet that need. So it doesn't have to be a large rigid structure to do it, but you do need that mechanical refrigeration. Um, uh, plan time just says, you know, there's really another job risk factor. We have the environment, we have the work demands, and um, we have the clothing requirements. But really, if I know somebody can work safely for four hours and I only need them to work for two hours, then really I can have them work there fine. And so the, there are a number of these curves out. This happens to be uh, from uh, the recommendations of the US Navy, but you can, uh, you can say, okay, we're gonna plan to go two hours at uh, uh, a light rate of, of work and knowing that somebody can, uh, you know, at, at uh, 40 degrees, and that's better than the, 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 um, the, the, the 30, but they can only go two hours, right? But that would be the use of a plan time. Uh, Self-limitation, uh, it, you know, it is a hygiene practice, but it, when you use it as an administrative control, it, it does a couple of things. One is it extends the work time beyond the protective limits. Because remember these occupation exposure limits protect most people most of the time. Uh, which means a lot of people can work above it. We just don't know who those people are. So uh, it, we, can, we can extend the time, we get more productivity, but we get greater risk. So we have to figure out how it is that we're going to manage or accept that risk. And the criteria to stop should be untoward symptoms, you know, kind of where we already are, you know, go in there, work as hard as you can, and when you feel bad, come on out, is, is the, the traditional way. We did some work in the lab. It didn't directly address that issue, but what we found was that the, uh, that decision wasn't very good. Uh, in other words, probably less than 10% of the time did we get somebody that said, okay, it's time to stop when we would look at them physiologically and say, we think you should have stopped before then. Uh, so personal monitoring, looking at heart rate or, or body core temperature plus the onset of symptoms is supposed to, will, will provide a, a more informed, more reliable outcome. Um, Problem is, is especially core temperature, you can't measure it easily. Heart rate, we can get fairly reliably. Uh, so there are a number of heart rate methods uh, and I'll just highlight some of these to you. We're not ever gonna measure core temperature in any way that could be conventionally described as core. So we're really going to use surface temperatures and then, or surrogate temperature, surrogates. And then sometimes it's best to measure both. Um, so on measuring uh, heat strain, uh, temperature is the primary indicator. We really are trying to keep people from uh, a body core temperature in excess of 39 degrees C. Uh, heart rate is a good 
preceding indicator. Whenever you're watching somebody work, is their body core temperature is going to start going up. In fact, their heart rate starts going up first. And that's because it's trying to get more and more blood out to the skin to dissipate that heat. And it's failing to do it. Um, so the principal measures of core temperature are really socially unacceptable and in the laboratory they're not comfortable so you know it, it really argues against it, extraordinary circumstances so the indirect measurements are oral ear canal uh, i am not a fan of the infrared devices in the ears for a, a number of reasons uh, the uh, surface mounted disc is it was it was popular, it lost, and, it, and I think it's starting to come back again. Um, but let's just hit on a couple of those. Um, the, the deep body temperatures, indicative of total heat content, that's helpful to know. Um, when we talk about body core temperature, the World Health Organization says that 38 degrees is, is safe. If you're careful about it, you can go to 39. Those data are by and large a, a bit suspect now. Uh, they're not wrong, but, but they're, they are clouded in how to best interpret it. But generally what we specify in predicted values is somewhere between 38, if we're, it's a straight prediction to 38.5 uh, if, if we're uh, trying to uh, do a, a surrogate measure. Uh, oral temperature is, uh, is actually what I use in the field. I like it a lot. Uh, it, it is sublingual. You've got to take some precautions about no eating or drinking and, and how you take it somewhat influenced by the environment. That's the downside uh, and use something that's clinically acceptable and calibrated. Uh, temperature, I, I've used it. I don't like using it in the field. Uh, we've demonstrated in the lab that it, it can be good, but a, a, a good bit of care needs to be taken and how it's used. Uh, there are commercial devices coming out that have built into them some adaptive software that I, that I that may or may not make these better. I, the initial findings are are positive. Heart rate is helpful because it's indicative of that cardiovascular response. Um, and there are a number of techniques. So recovery pattern, and I've used this a good bit, is uh, stop work and sit. And what I do when I have them sit down is I put an oral, I start to measure oral temperature. I get the heart rate at one minute. I cannot do it by palpation to save my life, uh, but you can get cheap uh, effective electronic devices that you can get um, like a, a, a finger oximeter that will give you a good heart rate. Um, generally, if it's below 110, you're in good shape. Uh, above 120, uh, there's probably significant strain. And, um, and if not, <clears throat> it's coming. So the risk is, is there. When we look at this uh, for moderate heat strain, it's got good sensitivity. The specificity is, is poor. When we're looking at high levels of heat strain, both the sensitivity and specificity of this method are good. We're going back and revisiting our data on this and adding some others. So I'll probably have a different view of this in another six months. <coughs> I can't seem to get out of this. Uh, peak heart rate, um, the ACGIH suggests uh, 180 minus age. This came out of Australia. I am um, I'm suspicious that it's a that it's a 
bit overprotective. Um, I, I think if you use a, a, um, a one minute sustained heart rate of about 90% heart rate max following this, you're, you're probably good uh, on that. And um, I, and this whole area of, of personal monitoring is undergoing some critical review now. So I think in a year or so, we're gonna get some more specific guidance. I average heart rate, uh, these data have been around for 50 years. Um, if the average is below 115, you can feel reasonably comfortable that there's not gonna be excessive strain. Uh, an average of greater than 115 beats over an eight hour day um, does represent increased risk. And certainly by the time you get to 120, it becomes problematic. Um, moving time averages are another way of kind of softening the, the, the peaks that you ordinarily get. Um, it, it, this is more useful in retrospect than proactively. And, and Larry Kenny and I published a paper, what is it, 25 years ago on thresholds for these moving time averages. I think we're coming back with with uh, re-examining that data. We're not gonna have quite as many averaging periods, but I think that a 10 minute averaging window is going to provide an interesting uh, uh, predictive value. Uh, personal protection. So going into that last category of uh, personal, uh, of uh, the hierarchy of controls. And I need to actually add one here that I, that, that I, that I didn't, but, Circulating, it, you provide a microclimate that promotes cooling and, and or reduces heat gain. Uh, circulating air systems are the best. They, they, they just outperform everything. Liquid cooling systems are very good, but, they're, but they tend to be ex much more expensive. Uh, Ice cooling garments, I, I, I think, are pretty good. I, there's some now on the market that I'm less excited about. Evaporative cooling systems don't work. And reflective clothing for radiant heat has to be carefully, carefully selected. What is now really demonstrating value is, uh, and it's hard to call it personal protection, so it might be more an administrative control, but during rest breaks, if you put your forearms into cold water, it does an amazingly good job of cooling you down. So accelerating um, the cool down in, um, in, uh, during rest breaks by immersion in cold water, uh, arm immersion in cold water is very effective. I don't have the data the, to get you very specific recommendations on that, other than to tell you that it does work and it works well. All right. Uh, okay, this is just a, a theoretical, it's not a theoretical, I actually looked at our laboratory data, but it basically it says the more cooling you can get either out of, uh, uh, a cooling system or a permissive cooling from clothing ensembles, the, the, uh, the longer you can work at, at 300 watts. And again, that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, again, we, we work in a, it, ideally in a continuous improvement process. So we, we wanna reevaluate. We can do that by going back and asking if, if by the changes we made, if we move below the occupational exposure limit, are our plan times longer? In other words, have we reduced the heat stress? Uh, or for the same work, have the average heart rate or changes in body temperature have been reduced? So again, we've reduced the strain and I'm able to work based longer on physiological monitoring. So those are ways of asking that question. Again, as I've said, repeatedly is that, that heat stress management has to fit within your overall um, uh, safety and health practices. Um, and, um, and 
and uh, and of course the the industries that you're addressing. In the U.S., we have um, a heat index app that uh, helps you know locate you geographically and then uses local weather to provide information on the uh, the heat level. I don't know if there's something equivalent in Indonesia that could be used. And with that, and uh, timing is, is about right, I think, Dr. Denny, I have two minutes for questions. Am I alone here? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me uh, see yeah. if I can hand. Yeah, that's very interesting. And there are some more questions here, Dr. Bernard, uh, from YouTube and um, from Hendra Tanjung from Jakarta. Currently, right. there are many index for heat stress used in industries. What do you think about that? Do you suggest the best index to use for evaluation for evaluating? It's stress. Yeah, I'm going to reiterate again that I think the best method is WBGT. It, and there are a couple of others out there, but, but I like it the best. I think with some thought, you can use an alternative like heat index, right? Uh, the, with heat index, it doesn't account for the sun or radiant heat or anything. And it generally is thought about as an outdoor index, not an indoor index. But I think you can make adjustments to add for the solar load. And I've done that. You can do it. You can use meteorological data. And um, there's a, a couple of models promoted by the Australians about what you can use for meteorological data to predict WBGT that work well. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in w where you know your environment very well, you can actually get it down to air temperature, but, but it requires you knowing your environment well. Okay. So knowing our environment, our own environment. And, and, and especially knowing it in terms of WBGT, or at oh, least okay. being able to treat. Okay. Definitely. And the next question is that right now in Indonesia there are some workers who has who have to work in a dry area such as in um, turbine 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 wind uh, work location and etc. How do we manage the heat stress among these workers. Okay. I, I think it's the, the, the same. It's going to um, uh, look at the exposures, ask questions about how it is you can reduce that level of, well, first of all, all the general controls, right? Then when you're looking at the specific jobs, ask how it is I can reduce the metabolic rate or how is it can I reduce the humidity in those areas. Reducing the air temperature and the radiant heat is gonna have less of an advantage. Okay. And there is also a question from our junior faculty member from Ikawati how to deal with the workers who are lazy to drink just to keep rehydrate them to keep them hydrated uh, first of all you have to make it easy for them to stay hydrated and then encourage them to stay hydrated uh, and and the i think the important point is um, that they it, it becomes a habit you know, this idea of habit forming is very critical. If, if you expect them, you know, if you, if you allow them to drink, so let me give you an example. It's probably not unusual to lose up to a liter of water an hour. Um, it's easy to replace a liter if you take, you know, a couple hundred milliliters every 15 minutes or so. 
it's going to be very hard if you sit down and try to drink that whole liter of water in five or 10 minutes, right? So yeah. this idea of constant small amounts is, is really important, or you will simply voluntarily dehydrate. Oke, okay. jadi bagaimana kita membiasakan pekerja untuk selalu minum sedikit demi sedikit. Jangan langsung dalam jumlah banyak. That's what I'm, I was trying to translate, Dr. Bernard. Oke. Okay. <clears throat> And then, um, again from... Oh, Oke, okay. from Pak Hendra again, how to determine and calculate the workload of a workers in hot environment since the activities were varied during the day or the shift? Yeah, so first of all, the averaging period is uh, is about an hour to two hours it's a, a little bit of discretion there um so you want to look how how constant is the activity in, in say a given hour and then worry about that hour and assign a metabolic rate and then look to the next activity if it takes about an hour Now, if these activities take 15 minutes and 20 minutes and then five minutes, then you're going to kind of have to ask what is each one of those and then do a time weighted average to get a representative value. But don't try to look at a whole day. You, you, you want to keep it to a smaller time window. Okay. So keeping the walk, uh, shifting is very important is it that well what's important per is, yeah the i'm sorry so the walking period for how long is it the best time to take a break yeah it, well there's the the best time to take a break is in a natural breaking time uh but you want to allow okay. enough time within that one hour or two hour period of time that you're going to get recovery, right? Um, it can be, let's, you know, just for the sake of discussion, suppose you need 25% of your time in recovery. Well, you can do it as 15 minutes out of an hour. You can do it as five minutes out of 20 okay? okay you can break it up any, any number of ways and the effect is about the same okay what you can't do is say we'll work for six hours and take a two-hour break at the end of the day you can't okay. do that right so the, the the windows can't exceed two hours okay so Two hours taking a break and then again two hours that's better than six hours then taking a long break is, oh is absolutely it yeah okay. Be, because they can die in that first six hours okay i mean so and i mean that literally but it's uh the if you're trying to average exposures out if you wait if you have six hours of exposures before you take your break You can get somebody up to a very high temperature. Okay. Yeah. And that the workload calculated based on the worker with body weight 70 kilograms and how to adjust yeah. the workload for a worker with different body weight. Yeah. Um, my response to that is please don't. I, uh, I, uh, We, we put into the table that it references a so-called standard man, which is a concept that's more than 60 years old. Um, the the uh, 
the, the metabolic rates are too complex to, to have a simple answer. If, 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 you, if you do literally adjust based on 70 kilograms, you'll way overestimate the metabolic rate. Okay, you risk underestimating the metabolic rate if you don't make that adjustment. But I think you're, the, the safer territory is just don't pay attention. Okay. And lastly, the, currently the, there is a challenge for the health workers, right? Uh, for the health facilities also to identify the heat stress and um, COVID-19 risk associated with the job function, the workplace, and then the facilities for restroom and uh, work breaks. So do you have any clue what is the um, current standard of PPE for the PPEs for the health workers that they could bear with the heat stress? Yeah. Um, my understanding of the, the current uh, PPE requirements is that they shouldn't interfere with um, the heat stress level. Uh, so the, 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 the thing that I'd worry about most is not the mask. The mask is not gonna contribute. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might feel uncomfortable and it might feel warm, but it's not providing heat stress. It would be the clothing. And if, there's, and if they're wearing um, the cotton scrubs and maybe an apron over that, that's, that's fine. Heat, that the clothing isn't adding to the level of heat. If they're wearing um, um, clothing meant to be a water barrier um, beyond an apron, then that might be problematic. And, and they ought to really ask themselves whether that's a reasonable ex route of ex exposure for the virus. Okay. I got this question a lot from Indonesia considering that not all health facilities are those who work from the field ambulatory services. They really have those um, heat stress complaint. Yes. Due to the yeah. people. And you're likely to get the heat stress complaint, but it'll be more discomfort. It, I, I you know, I, okay. I want to emphasize this is n not comfortable, but not it's comfortable. not likely to lead to a heat stress exposure. Okay. It's because of our weather now, sometimes it reach, commonly we have like 94 far, uh, degree Fahrenheit rather than 70 that is more luxury. So it's like 30, 37 degrees Celsius. Yeah, and that, which is, certainly hot but remember also that uh, the work rate's not high mm -hmm. associated with the healthcare workers yep and then the last question is from dr satya Nengse. uh oh the construction sectors especially in the highway and et cetera, or an outdoor construction sites, how do we manage the heat stress and uh, yeah, and again, without knowing, the, yeah, without yeah. knowing the specific job, it, it's the same answer I gave before, you know, try to all the general controls and then try to understand where your exposures are um, with construction trucks um, I'm what I've seen is that a lot of companies will not invest in air-conditioned vehicles 
And mm -hmm. we've tried to make the case that that increased productivity by having an air conditioned vehicle makes it from a productivity point of view, it makes it a worthwhile investment. And some have begun to understand that. Okay. But that requires a careful analysis of that particular situation. Yep, exactly. And this is the big challenge for the construction business too. Yes. And, and I think the room facility is the best choice and the water access for the drinking water. That's what we do usually. Yes. Now the general controls are very helpful. Indeed. Okay. So I think all questions are already um, have been answered. So and it's quite clear. And is there any issues then kindly um, write on a chat. But I think all questions have been answered already, Dr. Bernard. All right. Well, thank you. Again, it was a, a great pleasure to be able to, uh, to, to meet with you and uh, hope that we can continue this uh, relationship. Yeah, we would like to have um, some pictures, photo, and I would like to um, request all of you to turn on the video before Dr. Bernard uh, leave from this Zoom. Would you like to, silahkan menghidupkan video un, uh, untuk mengambil gambar, pengambilan gambar. Yeah, let's, yes, yeah, so we can do it sometime, yes. Yes. Silahkan kami tunggu. Silahkan dihidupkan videonya sebelum Dr. Bernard uh, keluar dari Zoom. Pak Agam, Alia, Mas Rante, Mbak Erlina, D. Agam, Mbak Nur Cahyani, D. Agam, Mbak Nur Cahyani, silakan kami tunggu Zoom-nya. Mas Ilham, Mas Ilham, Mbak, Mas Ilham, Mbak Nur Cahyani. Mas Ilham. Okay. So this is the first page. Are you ready? First page. De Agam kepalanya kurang naik, baru kelihatan dari mulut. Okay. Uh, cheese. Smile. Okay. I think we got one without distortion. Silahkan halaman kedua siapa yang ingin foto silakan di on kan Siap halaman kedua Halaman ketiga Oke okay. All pictures are all pages are captured So we make sure everyone has uh, their picture uh, has the picture here. Okay. But Novi, sudah selesai? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, to all participants, I would like to remind you not to forget to fill in the register form. And thank you very much for Dr. Bernard, who are willing to share all of his knowledge to all of us today. Also, thank you very much for Dr. Denny as our moderator today. Uh, we hope this event will be beneficial for all of us. We apologize for any mistakes in this event. And thank you once again for participating in today's Visiting Professor Program. See you all on our next agenda. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Bernard and Bu Hanifa. Thank you. And thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Dr. Bernard. This is already 11 o'clock. Good night. Good night. <laughs> I, I, keep, I keep turning off the video. Good night. Good, Good night, night, Dr. Bernard. I shall see. Good night, Dr. Bernard. Thank you very Good much. Thank you, for, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much for your sharing, Dr. Benat. You're welcome, certainly. Bu Hani, terima kasih sekali. Dek Novia, terima kasih sekali. Dan semua peserta, terima kasih sekali. Mohon maaf bila ada hal yang masih kurang berkenan. Terima kasih sekali. Ya, di S3. Ya, terima kasih semuanya. Terima kasih. Bye. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sampai bertemu di webinar selanjutnya untuk Magister Promkes pada bulan Oktober kita akan ada webinar lagi. Terima kasih Mas Eko, terima kasih Mbak Nisa yang sudah membantu kita di luar lapangan, di luar lapangannya. Thank you.